Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sift through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. Today, we are talking about apologies, good and bad ones. So, you know, we're sorry if you don't like the topic, but that's what we're going to talk about for roughly the next hour. And it turns out that apologies are a good bit more complicated than many people think. I mean, if you've ever made a bad apology and then tried to recover yourself after doing so, you find out just how complicated they can be and how complicated dealing with other people who are not happy with your apology can be, (laughs) right? But yeah, we're going to explore the ins and outs. We've got some uh, cool scenarios, some drawn from the headlines, ripped from real life to examine, but we're hopefully going to give some some ideas about how to apologize well. And now, Dan, this is a topic that you originally pitched. Why did you want to go into apologies? I think they're a, a very large component of you know maintaining relationships. It's definitely a, a, an expression of ethics. Um, and we can we'll get into a little bit of like the different reasons why different uh, ethical systems will choose to apologize um but also just uh you know it's in the culture it's it's part of the zeitgeist of you know you mm. uh, the the youtuber that that has somehow transgressed <laughs> and then they they have some crying overly dramatic you know a big bawling uh, apology uh, but even though they 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 look like they're a you know a, a wreck they they still just whiff on these apologies you know the the constant um i'm sorry that you feel that yeah that's a good one um um, just uh or or just apologizing in order to try to you know um soothe the crowd even though you don't actually believe it and it's, it's usually really apparent uh that they do that and i guess you could yeah, potentially, if you're a good enough actor, you know, mimic what a good apology is. But yeah. that only is the good enough for the speech act of the apology. But there's, you know, much more. There's actual restitution, and there's changing of, you know, um, actions that are going to then proceed after that. And and those things, you know, you can't just get away with an act. That's a really interesting point that I want to come back to, and maybe we'll hit on this more. There, there seem to be a lot of people who are very, very clueless about how apologies work and why they matter and why they should do them right. And it strikes me as kind of similar to students who plagiarize. You know, the majority of plagiarism that we see out there, it's it's so badly done that it's super easy to catch. And mm-hmm. it's funny because... They, there was a, a conversation on this, a long conversation between professors on Twitter because there's a new um, tool that's being used by students to paraphrase. And of course, they're totally screwing it up. You know, it's an, it's an AI like paraphraser kind of generator. And instead of working well, it creates goofy paraphrases that a professor reading the thing can easily catch. And, and somebody remarked, why is it that students who plagiarize think that we professors are so dumb that we're not going to catch these like really easy ones? And it's just, I think it's the mm-hmm. same way with a, a lot of bad apologies. You know, the people who are giving them, you look at them and you're almost like shocked. You're like, how can you possibly think that would make things better? Right? Yeah, it's it's a, it's surprising, and it. I don't know if it's just like one is not taught how to actually do this properly. We obviously oh, teach yeah. our kids to like, you know, say I'm sorry, but like that's uh, as we'll go into just saying I'm sorry is, is not an apology. Yeah. Um, and I don't know. It's, it's, it's a little bit baffling that uh, people can go through life and, and get to their, you know, maybe your twenties or something and don't have, um, a moment and when they had to apologize sincerely uh well you know that's 
I mean, maybe some people never apologize sincerely if they're very egotistical or manipulative. And I think you're right. Most people actually don't get much teaching or even coaching on how to how to apologize well. It's usually it's sort of like anger management. You know, we, in our society, we have lots and lots of angry people. We don't really teach anger management in like, you know, a middle school or high school curriculum where it might actually be very helpful. And generally, you have to like cross a threshold. You have to screw up enough. And then they send you to anger management class. And now you start getting resources and learning about it. But you have to like really have screwed up to merit that. And maybe it's that way with apologies, except that I think a lot of people never get any coaching, no matter how bad they are mm. with the apologies. Or if they do, it's just they happen to have a, a mentor who pays attention to them or somebody else in their life who says, hey, man, you're screwing up. Fix this. Yeah. Yes. You'd hope that the parents would be the, the, the first line of defense for, you know, kind of nipping this in the bud to yeah, but there's... teaching like, but you, you never know. And, and you can't make an assumption about what the parents were taught or what skills that they have. So, um, but you know, I guess, why is it important for us to apologize in the first place? Yeah. Well, you know, as social and rational animals, this is something we've talked about a lot on this show. We're not just pure individuals. We exist in, in relationships. We're going to screw up quite a bit, and then we have to figure out how to fix the relationship or, or how to at least get things back on track. And there's lots and lots and lots of things that we can do to make things bad. We can insult people. We can injure them in some way. We can do damage to their stuff. We can negatively affect them without even you know meaning to, um, like you know cutting somebody off in traffic even though we didn't even realize that they were there. Um, we can do wrong to people. We we often do offend people. Uh, I mean, if you're actually saying and doing the right things, you almost automatically will offend somebody. <laughs> uh, you know, we can misrepresent them. Nobody likes. Um, being told that they're this way when they're really a different way. And and we can we can cut people to the heart by betraying them. We disappoint people. Those are just a few of the many things that we might need to apologize for, right? Right. And it, this kind of brings to mind like maybe uh to answer the question earlier as a a hypothesis the reason why we're not maybe as good mm of apologizers is that we don't communities anymore and that we can get away with oh. kind of being the a-hole yeah, um, yeah. because you, you don't have to maintain those relationships. At one point in time, if you were outside of the group, you got ostracized and that was almost tantamount to death. If you're in a, you know, a small tribal group. And, yeah. I mean, and now that's not, the this that's there's not that you know deterrent you do have some ways in which you might be in a smaller group like maybe you live with neighbors but mm -hmm. if you know if you're in a neighborhood that's one thing if you're in an apartment complex where people are coming and going frequently maybe you don't know any of them and we could say school right but i mean we've been out of school for a long time for students at least they have to deal with each other and i guess they're mm -hmm. teachers um, regularly. The workplace, you know, that's an interesting one because so much work has gone online, right? Mm -hmm. We don't have the same contact with people if we're doing um, Zoom meetings as we do when we're sitting down and deciding, you know, who's going to get the last donut or, you know, who's going to go make the coffee or <laughs> those <laughs> sort of workplace things, right? Right. Um, but we also have... Uh, these what it is to actually set up an apology is to you know, uh, set things right yeah um, making things right or between people as well as groups um, and you know apologies uh, when they are real apologies are ways of acknowledging and taking responsibility I think that's really a key aspect of it. I mean, as you used the word speech act earlier, and we should talk a little bit about that for any 
listeners who don't know what we're referencing, this is an, an idea that's been around for a very long time, but was formulated by uh, a philosopher whose, whose name is uh, Austin. And he noticed that, you know, whenever we're talking, we're doing something with words. And uh, apologizing was one of the kind of speech acts that he called performative. I mean, and it's not performative in the sense of like putting on a show or being fake, although, of course, we can make fake apologies. It, it means that we're doing something, we're performing the very thing as we announce it. So if I say, oh, Dan, I'm sorry, I apologize, my saying I apologize, that's the apology in part, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's, that's an important uh, feature, you could say, of a lot of our language that we're, we're, we're doing things. We're not, you know, and, and so the apology itself, and this is something we're going to talk about later, the apology itself is an action that we might screw up and then have to apologize for again. <laughs> right? Right. This, this reminds me of another speech act of like, you know, uh, publicly reading one's vows to during a, a wedding. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is, this is a, a public display of, um, you know, some either act or um, commitment that is going to be uh, followed through upon. Yeah. In saying I the wed, if we have this old formulation, that is the actual wedding right there. Or at <laughs> least half of it, right? Because one person says it, then the other person says it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I guess what is a good apology? Um, and so we, we talked a little bit about like just some topics about apology, but like what is the meat? And so here we go. Um, so like a, a clear speech act of I'm sorry or an I apologize statement. Um, and then, you know, a, a sincere expression of regret. And this is one of the things like little kids don't always get. Right, um, right. Yeah. <laughs> They, they often uh, feel, they, they, they say, well, I'm not going to apologize because I'm not sorry. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> or I'm only apologizing because my mom told me to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but actually, sincere expression of regret, an acknowledgement of the social norms or expectations that were broken, an acknowledgement of the responsibility now, what is, that you what are does actually- that mean? Uh, the responsibility? Yeah. Or How, the, what does it mean to be responsible in this this case? So you're you're saying like I I've done this thing and it was my own actions to so actually take that upon yourself instead of like kind of otherizing it's like I'm sorry like the the earlier we we're talking yeah. about like I'm sorry that you felt something or whereas that is, mistakes or, were made oh yeah <laughs> um and, and now and now we're like removing ourselves from the act. Okay. And and you really need to, if we're doing an honest apology, you have to acknowledge the things that you actually did and take responsibility for the actions that you did. Um, a uh, a declaration of repentance. So I don't want to do that anymore. Um, and um, some offer of restitution. You know, making uh, it right. Yeah, right. And, and so you could potentially do this beforehand if you like you know broke something or got rid of you know um consume something on on um you know if, if someone says something like candies and you know like you're a roommate and you happen to eat them like, <laughs> oh shoot those those are those are bobs oh yeah, no exactly um uh it, it's good to you know probably be a little proactive there if possible um and then um a request for forgiveness um but this is something that, you know, as we'll go in later, um, this is not something that you're required or, or obliged to get. You can ask for it, but this is something that is totally outside of your control. Why do you think the request for forgiveness is an integral part of apologies? I, I mean, I think it is too, but w what do you think that's about? Um, it is really about the the trying to set things right again like we we have this um transgression that has happened and has damaged the relationship somehow and this is what is hopefully the the outcome of this apology is to try to mend those relationships okay um, let's see you have anything more that you feel well I, I was thinking about this as you were talking about it you know there, there's a lot of people who don't like to apologize 
right? And mm-hmm. some people just will not apologize at all, or they won't give good apologies. And that request for forgiveness part is one of the often left out things. People are like, hey, I, I said I'm sorry. That's enough, right? Mm-hmm. And maybe there's there's a feeling, and I think there, there probably is on a lot of people's part, that when you have to ask forgiveness from another person, you're making yourself vulnerable to them and maybe putting yourself in for possible humiliation or mm-hmm. having your feelings hurt or something like that. And they just don't want to do it. So they, they ignore that and they try to move on. Yeah. You're, 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 I think it's, it's really necessary to be put into a vulnerable position because you've, you've already done something that was you transgressing, transgressing at some point. Um, and so you, you've already kind of done something that puts you in a place of power. And this mm. is, you know, you right, coming right. and, um, you know, hat in hand and saying, like, I've, I've acknowledged this and I really shouldn't have taken that, uh, for myself. Yeah. That's, that's, that's good. So w- one of the very first cases that we are going to look at is a recent one. Um, right-wing culture warrior and anti-vaxxer Robert F. Kennedy Jr. recently made an apology that a lot of people called him on and said, that's not a very good apology. And, and what he did, so here's what he actually said. I apologize for my reference to Anne Frank, especially to families that suffered the Holocaust horrors. My intention was to use examples of past barbarism to show the, the perils from new technologies of control to the extent my remarks caused hurt, I'm truly and deeply sorry. And so a lot of people chimed in on this and said, um, well, this is, first of all, his typical MO to give fake apologies that, that don't really address things. Um, what he was doing was, was essentially what a lot of people are doing right now, trying to use Anne Frank and, and the Nazis by direct comparison to um, what's going on with vaccine mandates and things like that. So a lot of people were offended, and I think rightly so. And one response was to point out, so going back to the, the repentance part, right, and the mm-hmm. doing things differently. So this is the second time in seven years that we know of that you've done the exact same thing and mm-hmm. apologized for it. How many more times in the future can we expect you to say it again and have to apologize? So that's a bad sign. You know, it would be different if like he'd said something, you know, also offensive, but in a on a different topic. And they're mm-hmm. saying, oh, you know, se- once in seven years, you, you apologize for something. This is the same topic. So clearly the last apology wasn't sincere. Why should we think it's sort of like the boy who cried wolf thing, isn't it? Right. Right. So that's yeah. that's an interesting one. Another person said an apology acknowledges wrongdoing, not just offense. Mm-hmm. So this goes directly to one of the things. <laughs> he didn't take <laughs> responsibility, right? No. Yeah. And then uh, yeah. the third. I'm just looking at, at oh, the quote again. And yeah, and, and the sectoring again. It's just it's not there. Yeah. The third thing, somebody said apologies don't have qualifiers. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm curious to, th- to know what you think about this more generally. But here, so in this case, qualifiers like to the extent my remarks caused hurt – Mm-hmm. nor statements attempting to clarify the intent of your wrong. This is not an apology. It's PR, they, they said. Mm-hmm. Now, so there's two things going on there. And to the extent that my remarks caused hurt, yeah, I, I think that qualifier turns it, it, everything that follows after that, you know, saying I'm truly and deeply sorry. You can't be truly and do, deeply sorry if you're only sorry to the extent that your your remarks <laughs> caused hurt, right? Like, People told you that they they caused hurt. You say I caused some hurt and damage by doing this thing. I am taking responsibility for my actions. When you would throw those qualifiers in it, it just it it sours the whole thing. Yeah, that's actually a good point. If somebody has already told you, do you really have do you really have any grounds? I don't want to say do you have the right because anybody can say anything. Do you have do you have the, any good grounds for making a qualification like to the extent when you already know that it is to this extent, mm-hmm. you know? And, or you're like, well, I'm apologizing for this thing, but some other people said that um, they hurt me in other ways, so I'm not talking about those people. Oh, right. So you're now you're excluding, you know, not that that might be true in this case but like we're we're parsing the sentence yeah 
The other thing, you know, so I'm kind of divided on on this issue in general, but I think it was a mistake in the case of Robert Kennedy Jr. to do this. If you're apologizing to somebody, should you tell them why you did the thing that you did or why you said the thing that you did in this case? Or is putting your own motives and intentions in it, you know, watering down the I'm sorry effect of the apology? I mean, there's that old thing to understand is to excuse. And maybe a lot of people want to be understood and thereby excused when they say, well, you know, my motives were doing this. In this case, I think he was off base to do that. But, you know, there I think we could imagine cases where somebody says, oh, you know, I didn't mean to ding your car. I was actually like opening up a pack of uh, – I was opening up a stick of chewing gum and looking down at that as I was driving in the crowded street. And I accidentally, you know, nudged your car because of that. Um, that might not necessarily be a bad apology because of that. I think – what do you think? I think that still weakens the apology if you're like, oh, I accidentally did this because I was doing this other thing that was wrong. Uh, okay. You know, like <laughs> in the example that you just gave um, is, you know, I, I was being an inattentive driver and yeah, eating yeah. while driving. And uh, at that point in time, you say, I was wrong to do that. That, that should be part of your apology. And okay. uh, I need to not do that while I'm driving because it resulted in this consequence of this. Even though you weren't like intending to do that. Most of us don't intend to uh, harm people, but we still do it. So so to take a similarly structured thing, like let's say you and I get into to an argument and I lose mm-hmm. control of my temper and I, I call you some, some terrible name, right? Mm-hmm. Um Actually, like, you know, you told me about the thing that they used to call you back in middle school because everybody had some some middle school name that they got. And I I deliberately used that on you. Right. Mm -hmm. And then you're mad at me afterwards. And I come and I say, oh, Dan, I'm so sorry. I was mad at you. And that's why I said that thing. If I Mm -hmm. if I say I was mad at you and I'm I'm using that to sort of justify what I'm doing, clearly not an Mm -hmm. apology. If I'm just kind of throwing it in, maybe it's not helpful. If I Mm -hmm. say I was mad at you and I shouldn't have gotten mad at you. That's a second bad thing that I did, and that led to this other bad thing. Then that could make for a better apology, right? Yes, I would absolutely agree. Okay. Well, let's talk about different kinds of apologies. Um, one of the papers that I use when I'm teaching business ethics is um, called Why Saying I'm Sorry is Not Good Enough, The Ethics of Corporate Apologies. And it's by this guy, Daryl Kern, in Business Ethics Quarterly. And he makes a distinction between three different kinds of apologies. And I think it can be helpful for us to bring this in. We're mostly focusing on one, but we could be focused on others. So he breaks it down into private or interpersonal apologies, like the ones that we've been discussing so far. Mm -hmm. And then corporate or CEO apologies. And that's what his paper focuses on. And I think it's actually a really good examination about how corporate apologies often don't meet the mark. They don't, they don't mm-hmm. achieve what they're supposed to do. And then he talks about nation state or collective apologies. Like, you know, if we, if we apologize for slavery, you know, mm-hmm. to African Americans as a nation, and acknowledge the wrong and the harm that was done and, and apologize for not following through on reconstruction and go on and on and on, right? Those those are those kinds of apologies. And each of these has its own characteristics. You know, you don't necessarily expect the same thing out of an interpersonal apology as you do out from a, a corporate CEO. Um, I don't think this covers all the grounds, though. You know, we we talked about kids and making them apologize, I, I think we could call those training apologies. And we don't we don't expect them to be totally genuine, sincere, effective. We, we're just trying to like get people into the groove of recognizing that you know norms have been broken, other people have seen it, they got to do something. And you know we can screw kids up. We can like say, well, all you got to do is say you're sorry, and then you move on. And that's not a good way to do it. But I think those training apologies could be quite good. And maybe we extend those to adults that are not all that morally developed, you know, if we're, if we're training them or coaching them, right? Yeah, you know, what's the, like, you, you don't come out of the womb with a fully developed, like, empathetic response no. to the other people <laughs> around you in the world. Yeah. So, yeah, a lot of times, you know, like, little kids 
they're mean are just not yeah they're, they're really mean <laughs> they're selfish because they they haven't quite fully developed that that fully human aspect of, of us being social creatures yeah that, that takes time um and before that like it's like as you said like the training i think is very useful another one that i've seen is um oh uh you know you hit timmy over there make the face that you think timmy would f- uh, make that that happen to him that kind of like as a training That's to try to yeah, uh, because they they might not get it as concepts of being sad. Yeah, but like, yeah. They really get like, oh, I got hurt, and this is the face that I usually make. Yeah, and the ability to do that—that's something very important for uh, for human beings, right? To be able to recognize other people's emotions, we call that emotional intelligence. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's other apologies that get made by people who aren't CEOs in virtue of their role or their function like a a teacher could apologize for not having um as i've done sometimes in the past not having everything ready for the students you know not having everything in the course management system um you know doctors nurses could apologize for causing pain to a patient when they didn't mean to um police could apologize for uh you know treating people unjustly um and then I, I'm curious to see what you think about this. Apologies that are private and interpersonal, but we make publicly. Do those become different by being put out there like on the internet, you know, in social media? Um, they're there, they're there for the person, right? It's an interpersonal thing, but it's also there for the public who get to, to see it. Does, does, what do you think about that? Does that – I mean, actually, one of the cases that you have with Dan Harmon, a very public apology, right? Incredibly, yeah. Yeah. Is that is that different than an interpersonal where, it, where it's more private apology? I mean, it can certainly have different I, like, effects, right? I mean – Right. Uh, and that's actually – like, when you asked me early on why um, – do I want to talk about this? This Dan Harmon apology is one of the things that like really wanted made me kind of dig into this subject, and and because of how like you know extended and in depth and how it hits all the marks really well, yeah, um, is a really good case study of how to do this properly, and especially in something that you almost never see from you know your. Uh, people in in power and corporate because there's always yeah. this you know cya right um going on and and this was very much like you know put it all out there in in a very uh like honest and you know vulnerable way yeah and um like i guess i would hope that more are kind of like the um the private because i don't know i think that we it is useful for us to have exemplars that we can easily point to mm-hmm. of how we should be acting once we transgress against others. Well, let's talk about this case study. Can you lead us through what actually happened? Um, because yeah. I, I think this is this is one that you know we probably should publicize more because the fan base of say you know Rick and Morty um, could probably use some lessons in in how to apologize given some of the craziness that you know, as a fan base they've engaged in. Mm-hmm. So um, during the, uh, while they were writing Community, so uh, another show that Dan Harmon created before this, which is absolutely amazing in my opinion, is Community. Um, and, um, you know, as there is for any TV show, especially comedies, there's a writer's room and there are people that were um, working within it. And um, one of the, uh, the new writers uh, to the show is a um, a young woman who was one of her first um, jobs in the industry, and um, Harmon had uh, got out of a um, I don't know exactly. I thought this was like after his wife he left his wife, but I'm not quite sure on the timeline there. But Regardless, um, he is uh, there in a position of power, and um, he becomes enamored with this writer, and um, you know is 
shoveling praise onto this woman and is um you know taking her um her ideas and running with them and um and uh you know kind of being absolutely infatuated and and like falling in love with this woman but in a kind of a a place where this is yeah. really hard for you know as you see um over and over again um when you have a a person in a position of power uh, that being romantically interested in another it becomes really difficult for one to you know rebuff those advances without actually uh like losing their job or or potentially having some sort of um vengeance taken upon them yeah yeah and um he um she eventually or he eventually like confesses his love for her and she's not interested in him and says rejects him but this but that was like okay well can i even stay here on this writing room yeah it makes uh, things pretty awkward right um yeah and and not only is it this like big awkwardness and this power differential but it made her feel as though um everything that she wrote was now suspect no longer was it on her own merit as a mm. writer but uh because she was the uh, the locus of infatuation for Mr. Harmon and so um, here we have a Har- Dan Harmon set on Harmon Town, um, where he he does this public apology afterwards. That he realizes that his aggressive behavior could undercut her faith in her talent, and lo, it did. He acknowledged that by singling her out and centering their professional interactions with one another on his attraction to her, he made her question her own skills, not to mention her ability to understand the harassment from where it was, and what it was. I destroyed everything, Harmon said. I damaged her internal compass. Yeah, so this shows a lot of awareness on his part, right? And it's interesting, too, because if you think about this particular case, being attracted to somebody, not a bad thing in and of itself, right? And uh, attraction, love, these things we usually view as good. And we usually think, oh, somebody's somebody loves somebody else, and they're helping them out. That's a good thing. But in this case, it turns out to be a bad thing precisely because now she's thrown into what's essentially an epistemological quandary. She does not know whether she's succeeding on her own talent and, and hard work or whether this other thing is going on. And so something that could be good winds up uh, having the opposite effect, right? Right. Right. And so um goes on to say, this is the, a basic and familiar pattern for men in position. A powerful man sees you, a woman who is young and who thinks she might be talented, a person who conveniently exists in a female body, and he understands that he can tie your potential to your female body and threaten the latter, and you will never be quite as sure of the former again. Yeah. And so what happens after this is not only does he um he he says that he um he once this happened and she leaves it was kind of out of sight out of mind and okay. he says I did I did it by not thinking about it he wasn't thinking about the repercussions of his actions when he was infatuated with her in the first place and then he said I damaged her I'm sorry I I got away with it by not thinking about it as well and so this is, you know, just kind of going through and kind of floating through, um, as as a um, a defense mechanism of actually not actually dealing with this instead of actually taking responsibility, and um, only, um, you know, years later, um, did he like fully realize this, um, because she she made a tweet, kind of like calling him out on his bullshit. Okay, and. And yeah. usually people get incredibly defensive. That's these. right, yeah. And he, he took it as, like, a wake-up call. And um, so there's actually... A, he has... The, or he had a podcast called Harmontown. And um, there's a clip from it. You can find it. It's seven minutes long of him doing an apology and going through all these tips. He takes responsibility in detail 
enumerated the things that he did. And then uh, specifically details the, how those acts impacted her in the moment and in the future. So we talked about how this was damaging to her, her internal compass of what, if her work was actually good or not. Yeah, yeah. That, um, do you... I mean, it's it's a very interesting case, and like you said, it's it's pretty much a rarity. I mean, this came out during the Me Too stuff, I think, right? If yeah, so that was a time when people are often people who have power in whatever way are usually defensive when they get called out on having done something wrong. If it's if it was a long time in the past, maybe even more so. I would imagine. That for men being accused of having done something during the Me Too like revelations, they would be even more on their guard. For so for him to do that is actually, like you said, it's a, it's a good example of somebody really taking responsibility. And what what came of it? Was there was there actually a reproachment or? Um. So, uh, she she was very like. One stunned that this happened. <laughs> that he apologized, you mean? <laughs> yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. in a, a fully truthful way. Um, and, um, and, and it, I guess, it, like, we're talking about, like, public versus private. Um, mm-hmm. like, this was, um, definitely something that was done in a, a public forum, partly because maybe she, he, he thought it was, the correct place when we do a a public um not a uh, sorry uh she because she made it uh, on on Twitter and she's not working with him anymore so yeah, there's yeah. no direct contact anymore um it it's definitely like kind of tit for tat for like the the platform in which this is happening yeah yeah um that makes sense i mean yeah there's there's a quote in here um by her talking about how she's like, I'm not dreaming. This actually happened. I have like the <laughs> podcast. I can re- re- rewind it. Yeah. I um, mean, is it a better apology by being made public? You think? No. Or? Okay. I just happen to think that it, it, it happens to be in the public sphere. It, the only thing that's the benefit of it being in the public sphere is it's a good example that people can point to. You know, one of the things we were going to talk about, and we might not go into it as, as much, is sort of the ethics of why why one should apologize. And, you know, in terms of virtue ethics, having examples like this is very important. But I'm wondering if from a utilitarian perspective where we're trying to you know maximize benefit, minimize harm, maybe public apologies are really the way to go because – if they're done right, like like Dan Harmon's is, they can you know they can show you how it's supposed to be done. It can lead to other people doing the right thing. I I don't know. I, I think maybe from a utilitarian perspective, a uh, public apology like this is better. But conversely, bad public apologies would be significantly worse than bad private apologies. Yeah. So let's talk. Um, so let's, about, I was going to say yeah, let's please. talk about bad apologies. What yeah. what makes apologies bad? And before we get to that, there's a preliminary thing where people definitely don't take responsibility, and this is something we could actually do like an entire show on. Um, there should be a name for this 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 sort of shtick that gets done, denying the need for an apology. So you you say to somebody, "Hey, you did X," and they say, "No, no, I didn't do X." Obviously, they don't need to apologize for that. And then after a while, they're like, "Well, actually, I did do X, but I didn't intend to do it, so I can't apologize for what I didn't really mean to do." And then they'll say, "Well, actually, I did do X, and I did intend to do it, but it's really not so bad, so I don't need to apologize." to you for that. And then they'll say, well, I did do it and, you know, I intended to do it and it was bad, but I had to do it. I was forced to do it by whatever circumstances. So it's not really my fault. And interestingly, this is an old pattern. Aristotle identifies this in a book called The Rhetoric. People will do this in law courts. <laughs> and so they do this all the time in real life too. Um, and if you do that, there's no way you can apologize because you're not taking any responsibility for what you're doing, right? Right. 
What are, what are some other ways people... Well, let's talk about how people do apologize and then mess it up. Right. So, um, I guess... The do you want to do the I didn't do X thing or do you want to go to the Let's talk about apologizing for the wrong thing. Okay. People will make apologies. And I mean in a in a certain way, I'm sorry I offended you is mm-hmm. a subclass of this, right? Cause I'm sorry I offended you because I said something horrible or did something awful. Now, that wouldn't be a, a problematic apology in that respect, but I, I'm sorry you took offense. That places it on the other person. Right. And, you know, you, you can apologize for only a quarter of what you did. You can apologize for the things that are easy for um you to express right some aspect that the the other person's not really that upset about you don't get to the core issue or you can tell them all about why you did it you know your your motives uh focusing on that rather than the effects of the action or why the action is wrong and these are misdirection i think they're not necessarily deliberate misdirection strategies but they they're a sign of somebody trying to change the topic in a way in the middle of the apology yeah, they either they don't believe that they should apologize, but they feel like they they're required to make mm. some apology, um, or yeah, uh, that I, I think is a common one. Yeah, yeah, um, or they just yeah. I guess that what I was gonna say next you know, still fits into that previous category. Okay, of, you know. Uh, you know, oh, you were you were upset. You know, this is kind of like the, um, oh, what's the, the that stupid line? Um, uh, facts don't care about your feelings or something along those right, lines. Right, right, yeah, yeah, uh, um, yeah. I'm I'm sorry, you're such a snowflake. You know, that's not an yeah. apology at all. That's that's no. re-insulting the person. You know, right, yeah. <laughs> um, so we can also have uh, another example of poor apologies is apologizing with tones, you know, and gestures and words that uh. Show that they're all apologetic. So, you know, we've all seen that, like, I'm sorry. Sarcastically, <laughs> you know, I'm um, saying that, you know, once again, talking about, like, that, um, you know, I'm sorry that you're a snowflake. Um, and, and doing, um, oh, uh, was it uh, Tu Quoque or um, You Too? Um, uh, yeah. Constantly, oh, like, well, they do it too. Or you're, you know, you'll see this in politics all the time, like, you know, oh, the, if it's something on the the left, oh, the right does it as well, or you know, or vice versa, or the left does it as well, yeah. um, and it doesn't actually uh, apologize for anything. Um, you it's know, just another variation of that is, I'm really sorry that I did X. Now, do you have anything that you would like to apologize for in in mm. you know in relation to that? <laughs> mm-hmm. It feels yeah. it feels manipulative, right? Right. Um, and if you're going to do that, I and mean, you're in a, like actual relationship with this person, that doesn't seem like a way to like maintain that relationship well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the if the the goal here is to actually maintain those relationships, there's a lot of there's things that you can do that's kind of um benign, and there are things that are actually actively going to hurt that relationship, and that's definitely one of them. Yeah, trying to score points places oneself over the relationship. You could say, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I always love apologizing. the uh, comment it. of. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I always love the comment of, you know, if it's in a relationship, it should be you two against the problem, not mm. you against the other. I like that. That that is a good one. Yeah. Um, I kind of like that better than all the variations on, it's not just you two in the relationship. There's a third person involved. You see all the memes for, right? And it could be God. It could be the government. It could be whoever you got to consult somebody else. I, I like this, this better that it's you two against, it doesn't have to be the whole world, but certainly just the problem, whatever your your the, the challenge, the, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's a whole reframing. If it's not, I have to get one over on my partner. It's we, we are working together to solve an issue. Yeah. Now, another way people go wrong that we talked about a little bit earlier is being unduly dramatic. We can call this over apologizing. And the problem with this is that it makes it more about the apologizer and the attention that they get and the framing that they get to have than the actual apology. 
So if you're using really hyperbolic language, you know, I see this when people say, oh, I can't imagine what you're going through. And I'm always like, of course you can imagine it. You've got a faculty of imagination. You're a human being. There's almost, there's by definition nothing that's unimaginable for us. <laughs> you can put your brain to it and do a little bit of work and figure out how the other person got hurt or how humiliated they are or how insulted. And so to say I can't understand that really places the emphasis on me as the apologizer and it takes it away from the other person. Um, you know, saying I'm sorry from the bottom of my heart, eh, you know, that could be useful. But a lot of times it, it seems almost so, you know, we use that word performative. This is performative in a different sense, right? You're like uh, a performer on, on the stage and, and you got to ask, well, who who are you doing this for? You're not doing it for the person that you're apologizing to. So is it for yourself? Is it for the camera? Is it for the audience? Because it, it's not reaching the person you're apologizing for. Yeah. And I guess this is a prime example of when you see like those YouTube apologies. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, tell me a little bit about those. Because I haven't seen as many as you uh, have. Uh, I try not to watch them. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, you, you often see um, someone being overly performative. They're... they're um, a lot of times they're they're bawling in order to like create a at least to to project that they're like sympathetic to the point where they're they're huh. bawling. Um, you know, it, it may be true that they are, but like it doesn't it doesn't read as specifically you're you're bawling because you are sorry for the thing that you did, but it's bawling because like everyone's like uh, telling you that you've done something wrong. Um, yeah. For the most part, is how that reads, as well as uh, you will often like um, have a lot of the things that we just talked about of like you know not fully apologizing mm. for things and not taking responsibility. It, it, it's uh, the whole you know cornucopia of different like bad apology in 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 these little nuggets of uh, you know YouTube history. Yeah, I mean so. If we don't know the person and we're seeing them on YouTube, should should the default be that we assume that their apologies are not genuine precisely because it's so easy to make a fake apology and, you know, edit it and sculpt it the way you want it to be? What do you think? I, I, I don't want to go to that. I'm definitely into the, you know, uh, innocent until proven guilty. Okay. Um, and so I'll, I'll definitely go into it. Like, yeah, well, this could be. I, I, I don't want to prejudge. Okay. Um, do you want to talk about forgiveness and the demands that people make? That's another way apologies go wrong. Oh. Um, um, demanding forgiveness. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is one of the things we brought up at the beginning is that um, at the end of the apology, um, you can ask for forgiveness to you know to restore that relationship in some way, but uh, there is no um, obligation for the person that was wrong to actually give forgiveness. Um, you know, this is it's not like uh, like an incantation or a spell <laughs> that you just like oh, I'm gonna do this thing and then everything's just right. It it might take a lot of work, um, and it might not ever work out for you. Um, and it, it, you know, you might have done something that that irrevocably breaks that relationship, and you have to be aware of that when you're doing this. You have to be put into a a vulnerable position, otherwise, this doesn't really work. Yeah, I mean, um, one of the things that was talked about in that article on corporate apologies is, and this is difficult, I think, for a lot of leaders, is the apology has to be empathetic. You actually have to like, you know, connect with the the people that you've wronged or harmed, and see that they are ticked off, they are scared, they they have all these other feelings, and those can get in the way of them forgiving. Maybe today, maybe for you know a month, maybe forever. You know, the other thing that we can say too about bad apologies, and then we'll we'll look at some some uh, interesting cases uh, that come from the AITA Reddit. Um, if you screw up your apology, you've, you've, you've done another bad action. 
And so you've got something else to apologize for when you've made a bad apology. And I think a lot of people leave that out, you know. Um, if, if your apology is insincere, if you don't follow up on it, you've kind of wasted everybody's time. You've uh, made it more about you than about the restoration of the relationship. And, and I, I think a lot of people lose sight of that when they're engaging in bad apologies, you know. They don't realize that they're just like heaping stuff on top of it. So we've got some interesting AITA uh, Reddit forum things where people, AITA, am I the a-hole, you know, um, people actually put these out and ask other people, hey, what do you think about this? So let me just read the first one and get your take on this. Um, it's AITA for not accepting my sister's apology for her attitude on handouts now that she's on the receiving end. So it's about some hypocrisy. I have two siblings, and this involves primarily my oldest sister. Growing up, my sister always had a boomer mentality where we shouldn't get anything because she never got it or how we should suffer because she did. She didn't like to see us get any gifts or what she considered handouts for free, as she has a very transactional mindset about these things. So if we get a gift, now we owe the gifter in some way. My oldest sister has always prided herself on being the independent type, one who doesn't take handouts or sells herself based on principle. Now she's done a total 180 over the past three years. She went from being fully independent on her own salary to jobless and fully dependent on her husband, my mom's husband, me and my other sister. I kept quiet about how hypocritical she's been for suddenly being okay with gifts and becoming fully dependent on others since people can change. Maybe she's reflected on her situation, but I finally blew up at her after she got mad at me for making a joke about how different her 30th birthday present was from our middle sister's 30th gift, which is a, a $1,000 PayPal deposit from our mom. I yelled about how poorly she treated us growing up for the occasional gift and how suddenly it's not a handout anymore when she's the one on the receiving end. She made a half-hearted apology about how she treated us when we were younger. And when I told her, she made me feel like a whore for accepting money from my mom's husband to pay for wisdom teeth surgery when I was unemployed and had no insurance. She replied, if it makes you feel better that I can acknowledge myself as a whore, then I can do that. I am. But does that make you feel better? I haven't accepted her apology and things have been tense. She's been asking our other sister and my husband why I'm still mad at her when she hasn't done anything wrong, when I laid it out for her how bad she's been and how hypocritical she is now that she's finally benefiting. Am I the a-hole? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. Is, no, no, is she, no, I'm sorry. She's not. The, the sister is. <laughs> yeah. What, what do you think about that one? Um, the, the big thing here. Um, you know, the preamble is up to this apology, right? And and she lays out the like the the things that she thought that her sister had done that were not conducive to a good relationship. Yeah. And specifically says, "Um, you made me feel like a whore." And that's a pretty that's a pretty strong. Uh, that's a very one, strong right? yeah, word. Yeah. And instead of acknowledging this and and taking responsibility that she did this, in fact, she's like, oh, well, I guess I'm one too. And that doesn't, once again, you with not taking responsibility, not yeah, acknowledging yeah. the thing that, uh, fully acknowledging the thing, um, and not like uh, offering any sort of restitution, except for like, unless she thinks that you know, calling herself um, this word as well uh, makes her sister feel better, but I don't think so. I wouldn't call that restitution. Yeah, this is an interesting one because the, the I mean, the broader thing is there's a long-standing pattern of behavior for years and years and years, making somebody feel bad for a specific thing, then doing that thing yourself, which is as she calls it out, hypocrisy, right? And then um, how do you how do you address that? You know, I mean, the, the best way to address it would be to say, I mean, you could say, yes, I am uh, doing the same thing. Um, I feel terrible about it. Um, uh, clearly, her sister doesn't feel bad about it, though. Right. So it was it, it, it looks like a way in which the sister could bully the older sister could bully the younger sisters and put them down. But she didn't really care about it. You know, yeah. When push comes to shove, 
Yeah. So should she accept her apology? I say no. You, I think you do too, right? Yeah. She she hasn't done the requirement, and and even if she did, you know, um, once again, it, it it's not a requirement that the the sister who we're talking and that's that's writing this, um, actually accept that. Yeah. Um, I think we have enough time to do one more. Is there a particular case that you really like? Actually, I wanted to talk about a potential practice. Okay, well, let's do that instead, then. Okay. So, um, here's an example of something we might try to do. So, we, <laughs> we've already defined kind of what a uh, a good and full uh, apology should be. And so, here's an example of something you might do. Um, recall one time that you apologized poorly or failed mm. to apologize and write out that one apology, uh, what that apology should have been kind of review that um and if you are filling up to it actually tell that person that apology or apologize for the bad apology like th- this is definitely caveats as i think uh, greg is going to come up but um at least for um minor transgressions it seems to be uh of overall benefit this is a really good one, I think. Uh, you know, I, I like the going back into your your own mind and seeking out the, you know, probably you can find some time fairly recently when you apologize badly. I mean, if you're, if you're me, you certainly can. <laughs> <laughs> um, or failed to apologize at all and just, you know, engaged with the person but didn't didn't apologize. That could be another thing. Um and yeah, I mean, do we have to have caveats with this? I mean, don't don't do it with somebody who you're. It wouldn't be a good idea to make yourself vulnerable to. Like, if somebody was trying to scam you and you blew up at them on the phone, don't apologize to them. You know, uh, find somebody who's more worthy of your apologies. I would say, right? But this yeah. is but this is a good one. Um, so, so, for example, like I, I you know. We, we talked about earlier another uh, practice was like, you know, writing down like uh, at the end of the day what you did well and what you, you failed at and what you could have done better. Mm-hmm. And I, I found, you know, doing that at the end of the day, like giving you a, a time to kind of reflect gives me moments of like, oh, did I actually treat this person well? And, you know, gives me the moment to, you know, potentially go back to them and say, it's like, yeah, I did this the other day. It was less than amazing. I'm kind of sorry about, I'm no, I'm not kind of, I am sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> I try not to do that again. <laughs> I'm not going to try to fall into my own pitfalls here. Yeah. Um, and, and I've done this um, with a number of people. It definitely um, helped my relationship with my own mom when I, you know, am sometimes curt with her. Yeah, you know, there's that expression: "Don't let the sun go down on an, on an argument." Never go to bed angry. That that sort of thing. Well, if you're in a couple where you've already done that, maybe the morning is the time to fix that. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um, well, so I think we should uh, finish with our final thoughts here, correct? Yeah, we're pretty much out of time. All right, so we leave you with the words of G.K. Chesterton. A stiff apology is a second insult. The injured party does not want to be compensated because he has been wronged. He wants to be healed because he has been hurt.